Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And to that end, Christ is in us by faith. Christ dwells within those who believe in his name. Uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, dwells within each person. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but when I go through difficult times, uh, God often opens up the word to me and refreshes me and gives me uh, the right vantage point to see each situation in the way that God wants me to see it, rather than me uh, going uh, to the situation and making my own judgment of it. So uh, tonight, uh, this text is a glorious text, and what I'm going to do is summarize uh, what we have read uh, in a very brief uh, manner, uh, but I want you to go home tonight and to read Colossians 1, 15 to 20 in your own time. Colossians 1, 15 to 20, because that is the crown jewels of Paul's reflection upon Jesus Christ, on his person and the work that he has accomplished for us on the cross. This is who Christ is through the word of God. And those five verses uh, speak so much and there is so much depth uh, and we just don't have all the time tonight to go into it all. But I would like you uh, to uh, reflect and learn uh, from uh, the words of Paul. From verse 21 to 23 is the greatness of Jesus' work that has touched the lives of the Colossians. And then verse 24 uh, and onward, uh, Paul is describing how he has suffered for their sake. And then Paul uh, describes himself as the servant of the church. And then he talks about his motto for apostolic ministry. So let me uh, open up with a, a question. Uh, in your life, with your physical eyes, have you ever seen God? With your physical eyes, anybody? Okay. Debbie, when did you see God? Sorry, I can't hear. When, when your sister was diagnosed with cancer. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. See, you come on Wednesdays and you get to have a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with your pastor. Isn't that great? That's a good thing to come on, come to church. Uh, so, with our with our eyes, our physical eyes, I think not many of us, including myself, have ever seen God. But we see the invisible God through Jesus Christ, the word of God that became flesh and dwelled among us. And that is a mystery. It is something that scientists cannot prove. It is something that words uh, lack in our representation of what our faith really is. We try our best. But what Paul says tonight, in the supremacy of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is this. He says the Son, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. That in itself should blow us away. Why? That God would become flesh. 
See, all the religions of the world is us, mere humans, trying to reach a God, a God. <laughs> reach them through our own resources. Reach them through our own passions. And yet, our God, the God of gods, the creator God, he would become flesh. He would actually come to find me. He would come to find you. That we would have a visible representation of God, almighty, Yahweh. And that we would be able to see God in his flesh lived out through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a miracle of miracles. And for those who would believe in his name, they have the power to have Christ dwell within them through the power of the Holy Spirit. This truth is what gives you and I hope, even in this season of losing a loved one, even in the season of getting a bad report at the hospital, in the season of our kids being wayward or being lost, in the season of promotions and good things, whatever the season, whether it be spring, summer, autumn, or winter, we can hold on to this truth that by faith, we can say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This word and this passage is such a gem and a jewel, and I encourage you and I implore you and I beg you to go and read it for yourself and let the Spirit breathe on your hearts. I wish I had all the time to go through it, but we, we don't. And after he preaches about the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all creation, through him all things were created in heaven and on earth, thrones and powers and rules, all of these things, and we say amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. After he explains that, he says to the Colossians in verse 21 this, once. You were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. He speaks truth to the church in Colossae that before you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, who you really were. And it's actually a message for us today. We were alienated from God. In other words, we were separated from God because of sin. Sin is the great separator. Sin is what uh, makes us go uh, our own way instead of following God's way. Sin uh, is what that creates the great chasm that nothing and no one, no money, no prestige, no power, no intellect can cross. And the payment of sin is death, the word of God tells us. So what we deserved was eternal death and damnation. And yet, what does Paul say in the next verse? He says in verse 22, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Wow. Through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, through his sacrifice, what do we gain? What do we receive? We have received this, that through him we have been reconciled. The great chasm has been filled by his blood and the shedding of his blood in the broken body. Through his grace and loving kindness, that chasm has been filled so that I have access to a holy God. I always go back to the tabernacle. How can a person from the outside get into the holy of holies? It is only by going through each and every instrument of the tabernacle. That was the way God commanded the Israelites to come meet with him. But let me remind you, friends. We don't need to go through all of these things anymore. Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, has said, come through me. That's why he says in John, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You have to come through him. Coming into a relationship of reconciliation. And Paul also talks about now those who have been reconciled to God, you and I have been now given, rewarded, given the mission of being ministers of reconciliation. Bringing those who are far from God to God by sharing the good news of the gospel. Isn't this our testimony? Isn't this who we were before, but now we've been saved and sanctified, and we continue to be saved and sanctified by the grace of God? Verse 23, he says, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Wow. The gospel brings hope. Why? Because we have inherited this perpetual hope this perpetual hope and glory that Christ has given to us, and we have inherited this hope. So why don't we live like those who have hope? Why do we live as those who are hopeless? At the root of many uh, emotional and mental diseases that we face in this world, at the root of it is hopelessness. At the root of it is fear. At the root of it is pride. And the only antidote to all of those things I've addressed, pride, fear, hopelessness, guess what the antidote is? Christ in me, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We present Christ to you. We present Jesus' message to you. And when you accept this message, you are given eternal hope. Eternal glory. You have access to all the glorious things that the Father has for the Son. Because we have been called and grafted in as children of God. Isn't this a mystery? Isn't this marvelous? It's, it's amazing. It's literally amazing. It's, it's something that's better than any of the good news that you've ever heard in your entire life. See, people who overcome cancer, praise the Lord. That's a good thing. We give praise. But what's after cancer? Another thing comes. And after that, what comes is a natural death. We all face it. Those people who were healed by Jesus himself all face death. But what is the hope of glory it is Christ in us that even after our physical death, we have hope for eternity with him, with him, for him, glorifying him, singing holy, 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 singing, worshiping, praising, being in his presence. Oh, what a glorious day. Oh, what a glorious thought. Sunday evening around 10.30 p.m., I get a call, and a pastor always knows when you get a call late at night, it's not going to be good. I brace myself, and I hear the news that a dear sister in our church family has passed away suddenly. I didn't have any words, but I just said to the daughter, I I'm so sorry for your loss. When news unexpected hits you, it really brings out the rawness of your humanity. Wouldn't you agree? When you receive sudden news of one of your loved ones who suddenly passed away. But soon, not because I'm a pastor, not because, you know, I, I'm any better, but, you know, the Holy Spirit He's truly our helper. After that moment of silence and, and just inquiring a little bit of what had happened, we prayed over the phone. And as we were praying, I, I prayed about the hope. 
because the word of God already in me had been activated by the spirit of God and that word was able to give me the truth, the life, and the light to move in a direction where God was inviting me to. Now, grief is a very interesting emotion. It comes in various ways, and one minute you're, you're laughing. This is what happened with the family on, on Monday as I visited with them. We were talking about the, the joyous uh, memories. Amen? But after a certain moment, I hug one of the son-in-laws, and we weep profusely. <laughs> But there are those moments that we have to embrace and accept because that is all part of the process in our growth as mature believers of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, what many people do is they do not deal with the grief in a gospel-centered, Christ-centered way, but they just suppress it, don't want to think about it. Don't want to talk about it and leave it all aside. And when something triggers that hurt and depression and, and, and bad memories, it all just comes up as a flood. And then you become a mess and you become collateral damage to other people because of your emotional outbursts and anger and frustration. And that is not the way that we as believers go about these things. In fact, what we do is we actually embrace the word of God through the grief and keep on saying the word of God to us, to ourselves. Christ in you, Christ in me is the hope of glory. There is a hope that I have within my own spirit and I know that person had that hope. Which brings us forward, which reminds us of the mission Yes, as long as I have breath, I have a mission on this earth to accomplish. Yes, we grieve, but we grieve not without hope. We don't forget them, right? We remember and we rejoice of the life that God was able to help that person live by his grace. But then we think about, Lord, there are still many people on this planet that need to receive the ministry of reconciliation. How will you use me in that mission, oh God? How can you use me in that mission to love others? And so the gospel brings hope. Christ brings hope. And so the word here, verse 24, he says, that Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, which is the church. This is Paul saying, I'm going to give everything to the church. I'm going to give everything so that the church of Jesus Christ may be built up to do the will of God and to make disciples of all nations. That is what I'm going to throw myself to. Why? Because of the supremacy of Christ. Why? Because Christ in me is the hope of glory. Why? That is the reason why I live and breathe. By the way, friends, if you think living a Christian life, living a nominal Christian life is just doing well in this life, getting your promotion, getting your extra stuff, that is not the Christian life. That's not it. If you think, well, only if I can get through this season, that is not it. Well, if only I can get that thing, or if I, if I can only get that person to love me, it is not it. The mission of the church of Jesus Christ is to preach the gospel to all nations and to make disciples of all nations. The gospel is at the center of everything that we do. So if what we do and what we're living for does not align with the gospel-centric message of Jesus, then it ought to be rid of. Yeah, but pastor, this is a good thing. I'm not asking you to cut away anything that you deem is good and pleasurable to you, I'm asking you to have the standard of the gospel in place. And then you ask the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will give to you a 
a good standard to which we stand. It is the standard of the cross. How can I sacrifice more so that more people can know Jesus? How can I serve more so that more people may come to know him in the fullness of his glory? How can I lay down my rights so that other people may find righteousness with God and to God? I wonder what you and I can practically do to live out Christ in me, the hope of glory. What can we practically do well, you might say, I have nothing else to give up. I've given everything to Jesus. Praise God, good for you. But I'm sure there's more. Some of you are saying, I'm just too busy to give anything for the gospel mission. Perhaps busyness is what we ought to give to him. Our time. Perhaps you say, Pastor, I, I have so many things that I need to care about. Well, maybe you need to give your cares to him, for he cares for you. I'm giving you the raw gospel because the Bible warrants it. I'm just the messenger. I am just the messenger. And by the way, do I live it fully? No, I'm striving. <laughs> I kneel humbly before his word and say, Lord, I don't want to preach anything that I can't live out, but I fall short. But only by the grace of God, when I do fall short, he is able to lift me up again and say, come on, son, let's go again. It's all right. Let's go, son. Verse 25, he says, onward, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to, Lord, to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Did you hear that? This message that was first not only given to the Jews, but now to the Gentiles. this message that was given to you and to me. Sometimes when you hear and, and read and uh, study the word of God, you really need to embrace it as if it's your own and say, God, I'm going to embrace this. I heard a wonderful testimony this week. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Alan uh, shared with us and, and taught us how we ought to react to difficult situations. Uh, and he quoted Philippians 4.13, and I wonder if you can remember this. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And, and I heard that in his conversations uh, with the, our congregation, many people were using that uh, word of God to overcome difficult things. In difficult situations, how are you handling it? That person would say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Difficult situations come. It is inevitable. But do you have the deposit of the word of God to lean back on? If Philippians 4.13 is difficult for you to memorize, then how about I give you this verse from Colossians 1 that I just read. Colossians 1.27, and is not the whole verse. It's Colossians 1.27b, <laughs> if you want to be particular. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me. And guess what? I've been using that in my own journey in the past couple of days. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Why? Sometimes grief wants me to take me down, down, down. The sense of loss wants to take me down, down, down. The sense of this um, losing a loved one. But not only that, a pastor always has to prepare his heart. Because there'll be more people who go on to glory within this congregation. And even thinking about that and preparing for that now, sometimes, oh, you don't know the work of a pastor. He doesn't work 45 minutes a week on a Sunday morning to preach. But that with prayer, Lord, 
Christ in me. May that Christ that dwells within me, may that Christ dwell within them. And in this side of eternity, may they find that hope. May they live in that hope. May they breathe that hope. May they live out that mission you have given them so that when they draw their last breath, it won't be a breath of regret, but rather it will be a breath of rejoicing. Thank you, Jesus. I'm coming home. Thank you, Jesus, that you have enabled me to complete the race. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ in me, the hope of glory. How about that? Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? And then as you speak that, proclaim that, praise that on your deathbed, if you have a chance to talk to your, your, uh, your uh, children and grandchildren and family members, and perhaps I'll be next to the bedside as well holding your hand too. Say, Pastor, Christ in me, hope of glory. See you soon. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So the word of God gives us that inner strength to be able to overcome any obstacle that comes our way. And the word of God is Jesus Christ. And everything that Jesus said is spirit. And therefore, this is the mystery of the gospel, that Jesus not only accomplished salvation by giving himself on the cross for our sins and rising again, but that Christ dwells within us, Christ in me. And so we end with these questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God? And this image is likeness and or a manifestation of God. Do you believe that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation? This firstborn language is a messianic language. It means he is the Messiah. Do you believe that through Jesus all things were made? I mean, just think about a chromosome. A human chromosome contains 20 billion bits of information. 20 billion. I can't even count to a million. 20 billion. And it is Christ that has ordered all of those chromosomes to be in place all of those cells, all of those neurons, all of those nerves and tendons and bones and everything he has created. And that's why when you come into God's presence, you know that there is fullness of joy. You sense it. Even though language is such a limited thing, you can say, ah, I'm in the presence of a holy God. Yes, Lord, have your way. Do you believe that Jesus is before all things? He is the beginning. And do you believe that he has reconciled everything to himself through his body, through his sacrifice on the cross? If you have said yes to all of these things, then truly you can say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Then God has equipped you now with the word of God to be able to go through any calamity, the worst thing that we can do as Christians in times of difficulty is to question God's character and say, why God? But rather, in those times, a mature Christian will say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And you might even say this, though I don't understand why, I trust in the who that you walk with me. Oh, he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. That is who we are, Christ in me. And so church, as we go through this season, whatever season you're facing, and by the way, difficult seasons will come. You might be just coming out of one. <laughs> you might be in one. You might be feeling, oh, I'm really good. You might be facing one real soon. Whichever season you face, remember the word of God, Colossians 1:27. Be Christ in me, the hope of glory. Why? The supremacy of Jesus Christ by the mystery of God's grace is within us. And we can be assured that Jesus is mine 
and I am his. And we stay connected to him. We stay abiding in him. We stay in that close relationship with him and receive from him all that has been given to Jesus. That becomes ours. This is better than any news. This is the pure good news of the gospel. So may this word strengthen you and me today that we can say without a shadow of doubt, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And we will march on. Why? Christ hasn't returned yet. So that means we have a mission. But he is coming soon. So don't delay in sharing the gospel with your loved ones and with your friends and family. Don't delay it. Continue to proclaim Christ in me, the hope of glory, and ask other people, do you have this hope? And they say, what hope? Do you have Christ? Do you have Christ in me, the hope of glory? They say, what are you talking about? Do you have what I have? They'll say, what do you have? And you'll say, I have hope. I have peace. I have joy. I have a future. I have a purpose to this life. I have been restored and redeemed. I have been given a release of heaven in my heart. And I know my destiny is for him and to him. All the glory, soli deo gloria. And that's how you bring people to Jesus. Share your story of what God has done. Continue to say Christ in me, the hope of glory. When depression knocks at your door, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Don't open that door. When anxiety comes and knocks at your door, you don't answer. You just say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Whatever fear comes at your door, you don't answer that. You say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Get behind me, Satan, in Jesus' name. And then we can walk victorious as those people who have been given Christ and who dwells within our hearts. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray.